April 21st, 2020. The PPP funding is gone. Where did it go? Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Coronavirus and Commercial Real Estate, your bi-weekly look at the commercial real estate and economic news impacted by coronavirus. I'm your host, George Morales of Blue Box Real Estate. Blue Box Real Estate, we provide commercial real estate solutions for office tenants and office landlords in South Florida. Reach us at www.blueboxre.com. Thank you for tuning in. Again, the purpose of these podcasts, these video casts, which incidentally we are also now releasing as podcasts through the Don't Sign the Lease podcast venue, so you can either listen to us or watch us, however you like. But we're trying to bring you relevant economic news and commercial real estate news so that you can focus on your business. And as we move from the great lockdown, as the IMF has called it, And today we're going to talk about more layoffs, unfortunately. But as we move to the great lockdown, we hope that we transition, God willing, into the great rebound. The great rebound. And that's what we're here for. We want to be your commercial real estate voice and get the highlights out to you so that you can act and you can move and do better by your your, uh, business. All of us have been impacted in one form or another because of coronavirus. Either we know folks who have uh, struggled with the virus itself or are struggling with it, or we know folks in our family who have lost their jobs because of the uh, great lockdown. So we're all in this together, and hopefully we can get through this together with God's help. And I ask you a favor, if you would, please subscribe to the channel, hit that bell, and uh, that way you'll know when all of the episodes are out. If you haven't yet gone to LinkedIn, follow us at LinkedIn, our Blue Box Corporate Real Estate page, all the articles we discuss are being pushed out to our followers through LinkedIn. So please do us a favor. Let us know you're listening. Provide some comments. Someone gave us some great commentary, and one of the great commentary was, hey, let's get get these things shorter, so we're going to push through. We're bringing to you five articles today as opposed to uh, the usual maybe double of that. And and we're going to go right into it. Our theme today is the PP funding is gone. Where did it go? And that's really the story is how quickly the $350 billion disappeared. Okay, where'd it go? And where's the effect of, to the economy? We really haven't seen it yet. And so the rumor mill from the Hill that's coming out is that there's more money coming. And uh, this article comes to us from BizNow National. Dee's Stribling, thank you, Dee's. A quarter of the PPP funding went to real estate retail and construction. Before the $350 billion Paycheck Protection Program ran out of money on Thursday, real estate, retail, and construction business together received roughly $63.1 billion, or just over a quarter of the total amount distributed. Over 114,000 loans, totaling almost $34 billion, were approved for construction companies, or 13.73% of all PP fundings, the Small Business Administration reports. Retailers obtained $21.2 billion, or about 8.57% of the total, while real estate-related companies got $7.9 billion, 3.22% of the total. The three sectors combined received 25.1% of the available PPP money before the program's payout ceased to lack of funds. Ceased due to lack of funds. Again, that's a big question. Okay, 75%, I mean, Think about it. 75% went to elsewhere besides real real estate. Retailers only obtained 8.57% of the total. I'm scratching my head, and I've got a lot of head to scratch. I'm scratching my head because most of the job loss has come in the retail sector, correct? I mean, I saw one article that they're expecting the unemployment right now is 13%. Most of that is retail jobs restaurants and um, big boxes and malls and so forth. But only 8.5% of the payment protection plan went to retailers. So uh, I think we need to do a lot more digging of where the money is going. As of Monday, the article continues, the SBA has overseen more than 1 million PPP loans through 4,664 lenders. The majority of the loans, 70%, were less than 150,000, totaling 37.1 billion. 15% of the loans were about 150,000 to 350,000, totaling 35.7 billion. Um, 
Senate Republicans have proposed putting another $250 billion in the program, while House Democrats have insisted that another $250 billion for hospitals and state and local governments be part of any package. Each side has thus far blocked the other's proposals. Go figure. They're arguing on the Hill, trying to determine where the money goes and who gets it. But I think we need to do a lot more digging. This is where the article ends. Okay, only 8.57% went to retailers. Only 25% went to real estate, retail, and construction. All right, so who else is getting the money? So where did the 75% of the money go to if it didn't go to real estate, retail, or construction? Very interesting. The PP funding is gone. Where did it go? I wish I had answers for you, but uh, I am digging. And if we do find answers, we'll bring it to you on the next podcast, which incidentally is set to come out Friday, God willing. These come out on Tuesdays and Fridays in the morning so you can mark your calendars while we're all at home and enjoy the video cast. The second article continues with the retail apocalypse, so to speak, and one of the most iconic gym brands, uh, Gold's Gym. And we all think of Arnold Schwarzenegger and, and the 80s pump and iron days when we think of Gold's Gym. Well, unfortunately, Gold's Gym announced and this comes from Business Insider, they're going to close more than 30 locations across the U.S. permanently, permanently. The closures include locations in Alabama, Colorado, Missouri, Texas, Oklahoma, North Carolina, and South Carolina. And a quote from the company, while the COVID-19 related closures have caused us to reassess the viability of some company owned locations and making the difficult decision to permanently close about 30 gyms, we know that we will emerge from this stronger and ready to grow. The company said. Now, here's the question. Again, if they're closing permanently 30 locations, you have to presume that all 30 locations, unless they were, they, and I don't know, maybe they do, maybe Gold Gym corporately owns the, the real estate, but I doubt it. I doubt it. Most of these are in shopping centers. If these are leases, let's just say even half of those are leases and they're closing, you know, what's, what's the discussion between the landlord? What are they going to do in terms of the rent and how are those leases securitized and who's going to backfill that space? And you see the trickle down effect. Gold's Gym might be an anchor in some small strip centers. And now the landlord uh, is, is missing a quarter or 50 percent of their rent and can't pay the mortgage. So you see the trickle down effect when someone like Gold's Gym's announced that they're going to close down permanently locations. And that brings us to the next article, which is entitled Everyone is Tense. Office owners demand proof of hardships as tenants seeks relief. This comes to us from BizNow New York. Thank you, Miriam Hall. The article says, across the country, businesses are coming to grips with economic pain on par with the Great Depression and social distancing requirements stretching for months, if not years. Now, it does say Great Depression. My mind read Great Recession, perhaps Great Depression. I don't know. I wasn't around <laughs> back during the Great Depression. I don't know too many folks who were to compare it. But yeah, certainly the economic pain is on par with the Great Depression. I, then I would agree with that. I read recession. So, but listen to this, this quote here. Social distancing requirements stretching for months, if not years. That cannot be. That cannot be. We, we cannot have social distancing requiring stretching out for years. Even the contemplation of it stretching out for months is, is not pleasant. But years? Really? I mean, they're anticipating a vaccine coming out early 2021. You would think that by end of this year, we'd have established herd immunity. We're going to have to, at some point, folks get back to some level of normal and, and trust God and do the best we can. Wash our hands and do what we can. And like we've handled others before, other uh, pandemics, SARS or H1N1. But to think that we're going to have to live like this for years, that's not going to happen. Let's continue with the article. We are asking ourselves, said one New York City office building owner, we're asking ourselves the following question. Is this an existential crisis or is someone blowing smoke? So the article discusses conversations between office tenants and landlords. Some office tenants have approached the landlord for rent relief and the landlords are saying, is this really necessary? Office owners, continuing with the article, are expecting their tenants to hand over financial statements, previous leases, revenue history, and where they see the business going in order to negotiate the rent. There's already friction between renters and landlords across the spectrum. Co-working and flexible office providers like WeWork and Notel have reportedly stopped paying rent at some locations. Notel CEO Arnold Sarva said his firm is already in talks to hand back 20% of its portfolio to landlords and a third of its tenants have asked for rent relief. So they're going to give back. 
20% of its portfolio. Again, how are these leases securitized? Look, a lot is going to come out of this. We're going to have tenants, I pray, who are more savvy on force majeure and pandemics and business interruption insurance and negotiate these a little bit stronger in their leases. At the same time, you're gonna have landlords double down on securitizing of leases and making sure that whether it's pandemic insurance or business interruption insurance that covers pandemics are enforced and carried out. They're also gonna provide that landlord, that tenants have capital reserves to weather a two or three, four month storm. So a lot's gonna come out of this. I think we'll, it's gonna make us a stronger community but there's going to be some pain and give and take and friction in the meantime. Uh, the article continues, Related Co's CEO Jeff Blau said earlier this month on CNBC's that firms with cash have an obligation to pay rent. Silverstein Property CEO Marty Berger told The Real Deal that while a company will work with its tenants, it can't be everybody's bank. So you see there's some large landlords, particularly in New York, who are pushing back. Say, hey, wait a minute. Uh, we're all going to have a hand in this. Continuing with the article, people are going to have to share financial information they don't, normally don't share and may not be comfortable sharing in order to get all parties involved in understanding the requested relief. Rosenberg and Edis, Estes attorney Michael Lefkowitz said, typically office tenants don't share revenue information. This is true. I know in retail, you're used to percentage rent, sharing your rents on a, uh, uh, revenues on a monthly basis. This doesn't happen. Uh, with office tenants. Typically up front, they might share their balance sheets or 10Ks that are public or whatever financial information is required from the landlord up front, but not during the life of the lease. Well, that's going to change. An official at a New York City commercial real estate firm which owns office scrapers, skyscrapers in all the parts of Manhattan, said many companies are feeling emboldened by a countrywide narrative that rent is now optional. Quoting, We've had a couple of professional service firms like law firms, a hundred person company, which is maybe a 30,000 or 40,000 square foot user, and they're asking for help, the source said, requesting anonymity to discuss ongoing negotiations. Our question to them is, you're a 20 million or 25 million a year business. You have zero operating reserves? And that's a question we raised in an earlier uh, video cast is, you know, we were in March. We were in March with these video casts, and, and folks were already asking for rent relief or laying people off. And you question, wow, down for one or two months and you don't have enough in reserve to pay April's rent. And now we're quickly approaching uh, May's rent, May 1st's rent. So um, that's the article from Biz. Now, everyone is tense. And again, it's April 20th. By now, demand letters would have gone out, rent would have been due, and, uh, and these discussions are real. I'm, I'm happy to say that in, in some of our properties in South Florida, 90%, 91%, 90% something, 95% of the rents have been paid. So praise God, office tenants are showing resilience. There's some that need help and our, and our landlords are working with them. Moving on to the next article, um, what happens when the great rebound takes place? Okay, let's start, let's start thinking positive. When the great rebound takes place, what's the office going to look like? This comes from BizNow Dallas Fort Worth. Kerry Panchuk, and there was a survey done. Large corporations could bring back office employees back in waves, back in waves. So here's an inside look from a survey at what the future might look like in a post-coronavirus world. Real estate professionals tied to major corporations around the world anticipate employees will return to work at different times with some organizations alternating employee schedules so staffers don't occupy workspace at the same time. Whether those shifts come from the uh, come in the form of different schedules in the same workday or alternating work weeks among staff members is still unknown. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in summary, real estate professionals are stating that they expect corporations to bring back folks. Uh, in waves. Now, I recently heard a, a Zoom cast that was uh, Arnold Sarva that we talked about earlier of Notel. The president of Notel was interviewing Mike Huaco, I think is how you pronounce his last name, of Uber. He's a global real estate uh, lead for uh, Uber. And, and believe it or not, Uber has offices worldwide and they have offices in Asia. So they're already way ahead of the curve. And what they're doing is they're bringing back 20% of their workforce. 20% of the workforce, and they've been going in and socially distancing um, the office. So whether that's putting tape uh, X's on um, conference room chairs or workstations, 
they're only bringing back 20%, and they're going to revolve, rotate, uh, I believe is what he said, uh, their workforce. So whether it's on a daily basis or weekly basis or every other day, however Uber is doing it. But that's pretty much what the article is stating, is we're going to see waves of folks come back, and uh, it'll be alternating. Uh, continuing with, uh, with the article, Cornet Global captured this strategy in its survey of corporate real estate professionals. Of 163 professionals who responded to the survey, 84% said employees will come back in the office in waves, while the remainder said their firms will most likely bring everyone back at once. So 16% of folks said we'll bring everyone back at once. Now, maybe you're a small accounting firm or law firm. We don't know who responded. Maybe you only already have two or three folks in, in the office, or everyone's in an office already. So why not bring everybody back if you can socially distance just by the way your space already lays out? I imagine when it comes to co-working, folks like Regis it's, uh, will be able to get back up and running faster, who they have a more corporate closed office environment than someone like WeWorks, who just crams as many people as they possibly can in, uh, in a cube. Um, uh, let's continue. About 25% of the respondents are considering expanded work hours and alternating shifts for staff members along with other strategies to ensure employees are not too close together during the workday. As for when employees return, 35% of respondents expect offices to open sometime in May, while another 20% think it will take until June or later. A majority of respondents, 65%, say they will consider it safe to return to the office when government stay-at-home orders lift. Okay, so that's going to take us to our last article. 35% of the respondents believe we'll be back in May in some form or fashion to bring workers back. Uh, 30% uh, believe it's going to be later, June. So that's 65% believe by, by June or, or, or later we'll return. 65% said they feel comfortable bringing their folks back when the government lifts uh, stay-at-home orders. Now, so that's going to be a question. Look, that's going to be a question that transcends uh, this discussion of commercial real estate coronavirus for churches, for religious organizations, um, for uh, the business community. How long do they allow the government stay in home orders to uh, take place before they just have to make decisions? The first article we read stated that some expect these stay at home orders to stay for years. These social distancing stay for years. I mean, you have to be kidding. Uh, 65% of the business community, according to the survey, will consider it safe to return to work when the government lifts the stay at home orders. And obviously they're expecting that to happen in May or June. But if it goes beyond that, will the business community change their mind and make their own decisions like Starbucks is? Uh, and this is the last article we want to talk about today. And this comes from Business Insider. Starbucks prepares to reopen stores closed in coronavirus pandemic, predicting a return to normal operations in June. So look, Starbucks is leading the charge. And we're so thankful, and I'm sure a lot of people out there are thankful they can get their caffeine now, from Starbucks, even though the ones that have drive throughs have been open, the ones who haven't had drive throughs have been closed, but Starbucks is looking to lead the charge in reopening their stores. Now, they're not waiting for the stay-at-home orders to lift. This is what that last article discussed. They're saying, we're looking at the evidence, and based on our intelligent minds and what we see is happening, we, the private sector, are making a decision. And boy, I applaud them for doing that and hope that more follow. Starbucks, reading from the article, is preparing to reopen locations that shuttered during the coronavirus pandemic with modified operations, CEO Kevin Johnson announced on Thursday. Employees will no longer be paid if they do not show up for work starting May 3rd as Starbucks adjusts its store formats and service options in stores that reopen. Now, I don't know if you know Starbucks do that, did this, but I know someone who works at Starbucks. And they offered them, right, because this person felt that they had... Uh, elderly grandparents nearby, and they didn't want to run the risk of uh, catching coronavirus and bringing it home. And so Starbucks said, well, if you don't feel comfortable working, we'll allow you to continue to get paid or, or furloughed with your job and benefits and so forth. And um, so Starbucks has been very generous to their employees. But Starbucks is saying that starting May 3rd, that ends. Uh, starting May 3rd, you come to work or those benefits are, are waived. Starbucks expects to resume normal operations, ending its catastrophe pay program and a $3 pay bump for workers in June. So I, I suppose that catastrophe pay program is what I was discussing. 
allowing workers to stay home. President Trump announced that Starbucks CEO would join other restaurant industry leaders in advising the White House on America's economic rivals. So it's, it's comforting to know that our political leaders are listening to the private sector. The coffee giant is predicting a return to normal operations in June. And this is a quote from, from Johnson, Kevin Johnson, the CEO. With governments, healthcare professionals, businesses, and citizens all working together, there is evidence many markets have, in fact, flattened the curve and are now beginning to see a decline in the number of new confirmed COVID-19 cases, Johnson said in a letter to employees. Now, again, I am not a doctor, nor do I pre pretend to be one, but in looking at the the, the curve and the number of cases in our own state, Florida. They were predicting April 30th to May 2nd, we were gonna hit our, hit our max. They were predicting uh, several weeks ago that we'd run out of hospital beds and ventilators and all that stuff. None of that's happened. In fact, it looks like we're probably 10 days from the top of the curve and we've been flattening and coming down, praise God. I don't know what the data was based on, but certainly it looks like in Florida, we may have hit the flattening of the curve three weeks earlier and are now starting to come down. In fact, Jacksonville opened up, and Duval County opened up their beaches this past weekend. And already there's conflicting stories of pictures of crowded beaches or not crowded beaches. Some are saying the pictures of the crowded beach are dated uh, to manipulate some stories and so forth. So who knows if you're at the beach in Jacksonville and you're watching this video, why don't you put a comment down below and let us know what the crowds are like. But we're already seeing signs in Florida of trying to get back to some normalcy. And I applaud them. We, we have to get by this. We can't live in fear. Imagine after 9-11, if we just stopped the way we lived. We did for a week. Planes didn't fly. But at some point, we had to face the fears and get back to normal. Now, I know this is a medical issue, but it's, it's the same mentality. We, we have to get back to normal. Trust the Lord and do the best. That's all that we can do, but we can't continue to be hunkered down in our homes and expect the government to feed us checks every week. That's not going to continue. That's not sustainable. We've got to face our fears and move forward. And I applaud Starbucks for looking at the data and saying, look, regardless of what you know, the World Health Organization or, or Fauci, you know, who's continuously idling down the numbers, praise God again. We're happy about that. We don't want them to go up. We're glad the numbers are coming down. But they're saying, look, we're seeing the curve has been flattened and we're making preparations to reopen. And I hope more private sector businesses look the same way and put the pressure on our governing officials to reopen sooner than later. In fact, again, pound, share the paying government. Let's start that trend because I believe that as the private sector has been painfully closing their businesses and losing income, losing work, those who are making those decisions, it'd be nice if they share in that pain and give up their income until we reopen the economy. We'll see how quickly we all work together to make that happen. But it's the private sector who's taking all the hits and the public sector, they can continue collecting taxes and, and paying their, uh, uh, their, their employees. Finishing with this article, sorry to go on that tangent. Johnson said in a letter, in Thursday's letter, that Starbucks aims to exceed public health requirements as it reopens stores. The chain plans to emphasize options such as contactless service, entryway pickup, curbside delivery, and at-home delivery. Again, Starbucks is taking the lead, the private sector, no one's mandating, mayors aren't mandating, commissioners aren't mandating, governors aren't mandating how and when they open and what they do when they open. But look at this, they're emphasizing uh, exceeding public health requirements by con contactless service, entryway pickup, curbside delivery, and at-home delivery. So uh, they're doing everything they can. We have a local Chick-fil-A, that we like to go to and everyone as you go do the curbside pickup is wearing masks, they're wearing gloves, they're no longer handing you the bags or putting it on some type of uh, tray, bringing it to you like this and you take it out. The private sector is adjusting to this coronavirus world and I think we need to let that continue to happen. Let the private sector do its work which it does best with, with less interference. So that is the last article I wanted to bring to your attention because here we have an example of a national retail tenant leading the charge and raising the caffeine hopes of all Americans as they're looking to return back to normal. Well, we want to end this edition of Coronavirus with a reading of God's Word. I want to read to you from Psalm 123. It's a psalm of ascent. These are pilgrims who are traveling to Jerusalem. And as they're traveling, they're singing this prayer. To you I lift up my eyes. O you who are enthroned in the heavens, behold, as the eyes of the servants 
look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maidservant to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God, till He has mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have had more than enough of contempt. Our soul has had more than enough of the scorn of those who are at ease, of the contempt of the proud. What a what a great prayer for our circumstances that we find ourselves in. Where should we look as we've had more than enough of coronavirus? You can probably hear it in my voice today. Six weeks of lockdown. Where do we go? We've had more than our fill of coronavirus. We have more than our fill of job losses, more than our fill of this health care crisis that we have with folks getting coronavirus and some losing their lives. Where do we go? Well, the psalmist here looked up to God. He says, to you I lift up my eyes. Why? Because he's enthroned in the heavens. He's sovereign. He's ruling over all. He's above the economy. He's above the nations. He's above this virus. We need to look to him and trust in him. Why is he trustworthy? And why should we look to him? Because he is a merciful God. A God who is merciful and steadfast love. And so we can go to him with our complaints, with our cries. We can say, God, have mercy on us. Be gracious to us. We've had enough. And I, pr- and I pray that you are doing that, going to God and just being open with Him. God, be merciful to us. We've had enough. I don't know how much longer we can take this. Have mercy upon us. And, uh, and those are prayers coming from a humble, contrite heart. See, the Bible says that God is high in the heavens and He's far away from the, 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 the lofty, the prideful. But He is near to the broken and contrite heart. So that's a prayer God honors. God, have mercy on us. I'm at my wit's end. I don't know what else to do. I look to you. We've had more than our fill. Have mercy on us. And I pray that as a nation, we would be in a state of repentance and prayer and come to God with our supplications. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Coronavirus and Commercial Real Estate. Again, we look to try to cut these these, uh, timeline down if we can and bring you relative commercial real estate news as impacted by coronavirus. Again, look for this on the podcast, Don't Sign the Lease podcast. And if you have any questions regarding your lease or need any help with your commercial real estate, send us an email at info at blueboxre.com. Again, I'm George Morales. Thank you for tuning in. See you on Friday. God willing. Good day.